Hello and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host. And on today's program, I'm featuring a, a writer, a director, a producer, also a musician, and his name is Brent McCorkle. Uh, Brent is the co-producer on the Jesus Revolution movie, which we'll be discussing in full here in just a couple of minutes. We'll also be discussing some of the new home viewing options of the movie as well. Now, as a filmmaker, Brent's films are known for their heartfelt and visually compelling storytelling. Brent's recent narrative work has garnered favorable mentions in publications such as Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, and Movie Maker. He's also been nominated for and won numerous awards. So without further ado, Brent, thank you so much, man, for coming on Thanks the program. Thanks for having me on, man. It's good to be here. Well, it's a privilege on my end, and thank you for doing this. But uh, the Jesus Revolution is a huge success. Uh, I, I've just got to ask you: Are you shocked? To what, what's your what's your perception of the movie so far? I had a good feeling about it. Um, I, I I felt like it was gonna do well and resonate with people. But you know, I'm also a human being and a a very uh, sensitive artist. That uh, you know, most artists, if you get around them, what we're you know, if if our guard fully comes down, you find out we're pretty insecure people. <laughs> so, so you know, I had all the ups and downs uh, of my emotions. You know, the weekend before it came out, but I I I felt like it was going to do good. I I actually have a good feeling about international on this one. I think there's going to be a couple really big surprises out there. So that, of course, remains to be seen at the time of this recording. But um, yeah, I've just got a good feeling about. Um, the international release of this movie. I think, uh, I think it's going to be well received and I think it comes at a good time for the world, uh, beyond the United States for sure. Yeah. And Brent, I want to, I want to piggyback on that a little bit. One of my questions for you is how important do you feel like a movie like Jesus revolution is? And, and it, it's so dark outside and I'm not talking because it's nighttime. I'm talking just a darkness, a spiritual darkness. How important is a movie like Jesus Revolution to Western society today? Oh, it's very important. Uh, the lost, uh, you know, the, the West has lost its way. And I don't mean that in an evangelical sense. I just mean as far as hatred and rage. And, uh, you know, it's easier to scream at people in all caps on socials than it is to have a cogent um, type of discourse with common sense, you know. So, uh, I love our movie because our movie is a call back to love. And so, you know, in this divisive, hate-filled, rage-filled time, unfortunately, I, what I see is uh, the church in the culture hasn't been immune from that. And so uh, whether you're in the church or outside the church, I think um, I think our movie is, is really sweet and it's really special and it's, it's very kind. It's very loving. And I think I think people are ready for a return to that. And And quite frankly... You know, if you look at the texts of Christianity, the holy text, you know, as far as world religions go, um, love is mentioned more in Christian texts than any other world religion. And so it would be so awesome if uh, some Christian thought leaders and, you know, and just Christianity in general in the West would rise up and said, hey, we're going to be a love forward culture. We're going to be a love forward um, people of faith that leads us into a, a new era of um, compassion and empathy <laughs> and love and kindness, because that's what we need, you know? And so, uh, you know, and then the filmmaker side of me, obviously, um, I think I think everybody's ready for just some uplifting stories. I think it's why Top Gun did as well as it did. I mean, you don't, you don't have massive body counts in that movie. You have a very uplifting, hope-filled uh, story where a bunch of people have each other's back and uh, work it out and achieve a, like a, a common objective together with kindness. And um, there's a lot of love and spirituality in that movie. And and, uh, and uh, our movie is, is the same. And so I think, um, yeah, I think kind movies that point people back to love and also point people back to the idea that maybe you're not alone. <laughs> I think, um, I think it's, uh, I think it's very much needed. I, I, I think, I think the world right now, especially in the West, needs to return back to what it means to be a spiritual, uh, what would you say, just a, a spiritual creature, a, a spiritual creation, you know, that we have a spirit. And um, I think right now, man, we're just like focusing on 
things that kind of get our eyes off the ball, like politics or culture wars or whatever it may be that hijacks so much of the bandwidth right now um, that, you know, I, I really hope this movie is just a soft little nudge back towards towards some of the important things, uh, you know, that Jesus spoke of to us, you know. Brent, um, talk about some of the reviews. Uh, it, it, this isn't necessarily a Christian audience that's seeing this movie, but you've been getting some pretty awesome reviews from folks that have or are not proclaiming their faith or no, maybe have little faith at all, but they see this movie as a high quality Hollywood production with a great story, great cinematography, great, great acting, great producing, directing, all of that good stuff. But they're giving it good reviews. What are some reviews that you've seen from folks like that? Well, my favorite one was there's this band of uh, of critics, and they're they're they love movies, but they're they're going to be hard on you if they don't like it. But uh, they're they're a band of critics out of the Los Angeles area with NPR, and I can't remember the name of their podcast, but it was so beautiful to listen to what they said about the movie because it really they really got what me and John Irwin and the whole team was trying to do and. and really to make a kind movie again about love. And so they gave us high marks and they remembered there was an old one, an older gentleman that actually remembered the Jesus movement in LA and all the like Christian hippies and the Jesus freaks walking around. He was laughing and remembering like what it was like to see all those people walking down the streets, handing out tracks. And he's like, Oh yeah, I remember that. And he was talk, they were talking about the bumper stickers and uh, you know, the Christian bumper stickers and all that that happened in the early seventies. And so, so that was a really special one to me because um, those guys, uh, none of them, I, I don't think were Christians. They were just looking at it from a completely cinematic lens and they appreciated the film. So I really, I really like that. Uh, I like that, that review, of course, um, <laughs> you know, you're going to like the, the, the favorable ones, but, um, but yeah, no, that, that one I think really st- stands out to me of, you know, the critics that actually were in that locale and, you know, somebody that actually remembered the Jesus movement and liked our movie. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, absolutely. Brent, now you're, you're listed as a co-director on this movie. And just, just for my own confusion, uh, what were some of your resp- – break it down for me if you would because I, I still get director, producer kind of uh, – they kind of merged to me. What was your, what was some of your responsibilities on this movie? Yeah, so uh, John Irwin, the other director, he wrote this movie with his buddy John Gunn. And – um Usually John Irwin and his brother Andy direct everything together. That's what they've done up to this point. But Andy really didn't wasn't interested in this title. And he's prepping like a giant um, uh, Navy SEAL film that was taking a lot of his time. So John Irwin still wanted to collaborate with somebody. So I, I jumped in with him. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, John having John having wrote it, I had to wrap my head around it almost like an actor does. It was somebody else's words. And so I came in and really got acquainted with the story and broke it down for days. And uh I was in charge of the majority of the casting. Um, I was in charge of the majority of prep and the hiring of everybody. Um and uh, you know, I so I, I was the boots on the ground director that prepped the movie. And then John came in a couple of weeks before and we shot it together. And if we had uh, if we had ideas for an actor, we, you know, we work with the actors together. Sometimes we split up. If we got behind, we would split up and I'd go shoot something and he would go shoot something. Um, John loves shots. And so uh, he, he comes from a director of photography world. So I definitely backed off. I, I love I, I love um, coming up with my own shots and everything. But I definitely backed off and let John, you know, do a lot of the shots with the with the director of photography. I got a few shots in the movie, but it was definitely Akis, the DP and John. Uh, lensing most of the film and then uh john once we got the whole movie in the can john departed and i was i was pretty much the guy in charge of editing i had an editor uh i did a, probably about 25 percent of the editing on the movie and then i uh me and my editor oversaw the vfx and uh i you know i was basically the director in charge of post-production and then i was the composer on the movie and i brought in all the like the needle drop ideas for like you know war by edwin star or jesus is just all right or you know those kind of things i i created a big playlist and the editors pulled from that playlist to find the needle drops 
Um, so yeah, so it ended up being a really nice balance between John and I, I think John and I's voice is almost represented 50, 50 because he had it more at the front and I had it more at the back. And then we shared responsibilities, you know, during the shooting. Um, and I love it, man, because quite frankly, directing a feature, it's, it's the work of two human beings. And so <laughs> having, I've done it by myself and it's really difficult. And so having somebody else carry some of the load was was pretty amazing it was it was a pretty great experience but yeah we got along and uh it was it, another interesting thing was when you have two people working oftentimes your themes or uh, or what you're hoping people get out of it can be slightly different you don't have to be completely on the same page and so john had a different theme than me and uh, both of our themes were fully expressed john's john's main theme he wanted to get across to the audience was that god uses flawed broken people and that we live in this society of like perfectionism where you cancel somebody or can them, or if a pastor makes a mistake, they're just gone. They're gone, you know? Um, and he wanted to really take it back to kind of a, a, the biblical idea of just all these flawed people in the Bible that, you know, did big things for God. And then my whole thing was, I just wanted everyone to know that um, everyone's made in the image of God and everyone is loved, you know, and, um, and there's compassion and empathy and a uh, place of belonging, you know, for everyone, if we, if, if we hold that value uh, as people of faith. And so, so I feel like both of those themes were fully expressed and it's, it's kind of, it was kind of neat seeing us make the same movie together, but two different movies that thread some sort of thematic needle, you know? Well, I'd love to hear about the cohesiveness of, of different, individuals from different backgrounds coming together for or making something greater than themselves. I loved it. And and my wife and I love to watch behind the scenes of, you know, famous movies, uh, t famous TV shows, how things c came together. I, I'm just curious in, in thinking back on the making of this movie, were there any memorable moments that you'll always remember maybe behind the, behind the camera or in front of the camera, something that sticks out to you? Yeah. I love that word cohesiveness that you use because I kept waiting for a meteorite to fall on my head. I mean, movies are constantly trying to fall apart. They are. It's like, it's like there's so much resistance, like the universe doesn't want <laughs> movies to get made. It's almost like it conspires against you to try to, you know, take you out or cause a lot of problems or friction or strife, you know, try to try to take take you down. But this was just a beautiful coming together of people from all walks of life. And the morale was really high. And yes, it was still very hard. And it was long, crazy hours. And I literally saw someone asleep standing up one day on set. I mean, we, we push <laughs> ourselves to the edge, man. And I always tell people, filmmaking brings out the best and the worst in people, you know? And I think when everybody's worst came out, we were still there for each other with compassion and love. And, um, and so, so yeah, man, I, I had an absolute joy working on this. I think uh, probably what I remember the most as far as a tough, a tough moment was uh, we shot, believe it or not, we shot 85% of this movie in Alabama uh, in the Bay uh, mobile area. Wow. And the weather is very volatile. They're very unpredictable. And a certain type of tornado will come in. It's like a water spout. And if it hits land with enough strength, it will become a tornado. Um, and uh, yeah, we actually had to pull the plug on our set one night and send everybody home because there was a tornado coming right at us. We had to stop the work. We didn't finish our night. We had to come back and pick all that stuff up. And it was, it was a nightmare, man. Um, it scared a lot of people. Um, a lot of people were in from LA and California. They're just not used to living in the dry line. They're not used to being in the South. And so just as terrified as I would be if an earthquake hit, <laughs> I guess I'm not used to that. I, yeah. grow, I sleep through tornadoes, you know, but like growing up, I've, I've only lived in tornado alley my entire life. But, um, but yeah, so there was some really frightened people from LA and, and rightfully so. And, and so, yeah, that, that shook us that shook us quite a bit, but, but Lionsgate was very understanding and, you know, we ended up with some flexibility to come back and reshoot, you know, pick the stuff up that we dropped that night. And so that was, uh, that was pretty epic. Uh, just a bunch of wiped out people the next morning because, you know, they, they, they didn't sleep in their hotel rooms. They slept in a basement in the, of the hotel just to feel mm -hmm. safe, you know? And, um, so yeah, that was, that was pretty wild. 
Um, and then, the, you know, the highlights, man, just watching everybody come together, watching everybody work hard together and, and, um, just have a lot of, of, uh, grace for each other. Um, there was some pretty cool stuff with Jonathan Rumi that happened to Jonathan. Um, Jonathan's a Catholic. And, uh, so, you know, he had, we, we took the actors to evangelical baptism school. So Greg Laurie got out in the ocean and actually taught them the correct way to like, you know, send somebody into the water in the evangelical tradition. And, uh, I thought that was pretty neat, but Jonathan, uh, ended up on some takes, you know, when he was in the background of some shots, he ended up actually really baptizing people. Cause they're like, Hey, we want to do this for real. Cool. And he's like, okay. So he, he said what he thought he was supposed to say. And he, you know, dunked a few people or whatever. And he came in at, and when we yelled cut, he came in and found Greg Laurie. He's like, this just happened. Did I do it right? Greg's like, yeah, man, you did great. So anyway, uh, Jonathan Rumi ended up you know, <laughs> baptizing people for real, uh, on, in some shots. So that was pretty neat. And then, the story about how Kelsey came to this, this, uh, story is pretty beautiful, but, um, he was on a retreat with some good friends in the business and they all lamented the fact that they had done a lot of stuff just for money. Just, just, you know, just picked up different work to pay the bills, which I understand I've done the same in my past as well, but, um, they made a pact that they were going to try as much as they could could to do work that had spiritual and social significance only from the rest of the rest of their career. Mm. Well, he got back from that retreat and went to sleep and he woke up the next morning and the Jesus revolution script was in his inbox. And he really took that wow. as a sign even and answered a prayer. And, uh, he immediately, he read it immediately called his agent and said, I'm in, uh, figure out the money, figure out the schedule. Don't let either of those get in the way of me doing this. I, I'm going to do it. And, uh, he just immediately signed on. Uh, so, so yeah, there's been some really, there were some really guided moments with this thing for sure. Uh, I've, it's, it's felt like, uh, in, in a very, very, um, how, what would you say? Uh, it doesn't happen. <laughs> It doesn't happen every time. It, it's, it's, it's a scarce kind of feeling, but it, it, the entire thing just felt guided to me on this one. And it, it was, uh, I don't take it lightly. And yeah, like you were saying, going, going back to cohesiveness, I've never felt more at home with a group. I've never seen a group of people fire on all cylinders together like this. And uh, I'm always quick to say, uh, the directors always go out there and take their this outsized amount of credit. It's it's not the director; it's the team with the director and the director like leading that team. So it's like um, you could be the greatest you could be the, or, the greatest orchestra conductor in the world, but if if you get like five year olds that have never played violins before, like you're not going to make those kids sound. You know what I mean? It's like the strength of your orchestra. It's the it's probably the more important thing. So this was an orchestra that was just all stars and it was just amazing and. Um, I just have a lot of gratitude to have gotten to work with this team and, uh, and be a part of it. And, uh, so yeah, man, it's definitely the highlight of my career creatively and spiritually, I would say. Brent, I'm curious, you mentioned orchestra and everyone playing together and, and being on the same team. Um, I just, I'm just curious, the question kind of popped up. You guys have got to become family. <laughs> I, I, and on movie sets that you've worked on, maybe TV shows, what have you. I'm just curious, how hard is it to put your heart and soul into something for months? And, you, you know, you're crying together, you're laughing together, you become family, and then all of a sudden it, it's done and you go on to something else. Is that is that difficult? It's hard. It, it is hard. And that's that's a really, really insightful question, man. It's a really hard business because you do... Uh, it's almost like your career mercenaries, you know, and, and you get in different trenches at different times and you fight your way out of this thing and you really do bond and you miss people and you text people like for the rest of your life. You may never work on a film with them, but there's some people on my phone I'll still text and talk to years, years later, decades later, you know, that I miss and I, I befriended and fell in love with in some, you know, in some capacity uh, on a film set. And, um, so yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah. it is very hard. It's um, the the closest thing I I would say is uh, it definitely feels like military service in some way. So you definitely go off to battle and you come back and there's peacetime, 
but then you're going to get called back up again and go out with a different platoon and, you know, a different, uh, a different group of people. But what's really fascinating is oftentimes you fight to work with the same people again. You can see that a lot in film too, because it's so hard. It's so difficult. And uh, so you see directors glom on to, uh, you know, certain actors or certain, you know, certain producer and director duo that stick together. And when you find, yeah, you know, like a missing piece that just makes your world easier or makes everything work better, or the, the work is very good, um, then, you know, you, you try to go back out with those people, but, uh, it seldom always, it, it seldom doesn't always go like that rather. Um, so sometimes, you know, you really want this actor, but they've already booked on something else. And, uh, you know, you want a certain script supervisor or a certain producer or an editor and, you know, they've already said yes to something else. So it's really, it's really hard to get the band back together and, and you are going to have that turnover and different people. And, uh, just by nature of where you want to shoot too, because, it's expensive to, you know, you, you're not a, a, a line producer worth, worth his salt isn't going to let you bring the entire crew in from somewhere else. You're going to have to hire some local hires, uh, you know, to save money on lodging and housing and car rentals and all that. And so there's a lot to uh, <laughs> there's a lot to consider. But, yeah, it is it, it is a beautiful, incredible breathtaking part of the business but it's also crushing and sad and and really tough it's like um i think every most people could vibe with this but it's like summer camp you know it's like that moment that feeling of nostalgia you're out of camp it's late at night the fireworks are going off and you're looking to your left and your right and there's some of your best friends like favorite people in the world and and yet you know the next summer camp probably not everybody's going to be there, you know? So that's, uh, it, you have to really treasure that moment in time and know you're probably never going to get that exact moment back again. Um, but it, it's also very special and very beautiful. And I would do it over and over again. Uh, you know, even with the, the pain of, you know, knowing that you're never going to have that exact same moment again, but I think it's what makes the movies cool. It's a special group of people in that moment that make that title, that make that story. And that story is singular, hopefully, and, you know, it lives on. And and uh, and there's a certain group of people that work together to make that thing. And, um, you know, so I, I think as far as Jesus Revolution is concerned, it's been the coolest, coolest summer camp of my career for sure. <laughs> Well, I think Jesus Revolution is certainly going to uh, certainly going to live on and impact many, many lives. Um, it, it, Brett, in one of your interviews, I think you were talking about your you're a musician first and your love of music is first. I'm just curious, um, how does your love being a musician and your love for music spill over into being a filmmaker? How does that tie in? Yeah, they're like, uh, you know, if you look at French and Spanish, uh, they're like sister languages. The, the verbs conjugate similarly. Um, the the actual uh, organization of the words in a sentence are similar. Um, and so I think for me, music and cinema are, are sister languages for sure. So there's a rhythm to them. There's a cadence. There's loud parts. There's soft parts. There's times to like play really loud and hard and times to play quiet or even lay out and not play anything. There's a lyrical quality to the dialogue. Um, there's a lot of addition by subtraction, which happens a lot in music too, where you're like, you get a track too heavy and you're like, Oh, what if I start turning this stuff off? Oh, that sounds a lot better. You know, there's just sometimes taking things away is an act of creation, you know? So I find a lot of, um, I find a lot of similarities and crossovers and I use all of my musical instincts, uh, you know, and bring those to bear even when I work with actors or if, when, if I'm in an editing bay or, um, you know, look, thinking about cadence, even as it pertains to when I'm writing a script, you know? And so, so yeah, I think there's a beautiful overlap there, but you know, I, I definitely, I think, I think the best thing I'm at and take it, you take it or leave it, you know, for better or for worse, I think probably the best thing I'm at is being a musician. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I use all those instincts to, uh, hopefully, um, make good films or, or at least try to, 
do the best that I can uh, with my instincts in film. But I mean, obviously I have film instincts too, but I was a musician before as a filmmaker. And I, I feel like at the core, at the generative core of all the artist things that I'm trying to do, you know, I probably, I'm working out as a musician, you know, into the rest of it. And, uh, but I love it. I, I love it. I think it gives me a really interesting vantage point and at least, uh, uh, I think it gives me um, like some commonality with the artists because I think well, like with uh, with actors, especially they're trying to find that dance or that rhythm, even with their partner. It feels like a dance. It feels like a, a routine you're doing almost in a musical way. And so a duet. Right. So if it's two actors in a room that I feel that feels like a duet to me, you know. And so so yeah, we're able to talk in those terms and try to find the the music, I guess, would be the way that I, I, you know, the way that I view it. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the, uh, I, th- I think you were influ- pretty influential in getting some of the songs for the scoring of this movie. Right. And some of the, uh, just three that stuck out to me. Um, I just want to celebrate rare earth, lonely people, of course, America and house of the rising sun, the animals. So now were, were you responsible for tracking these songs down and they had to be expensive, oh, yeah. right? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a saga in and of its, of itself. Um, so I, I really got made fun of cause I have really expensive tastes, you know, so we just put everything we wanted in the movie. And, um, I had two music supervisors. I have this wonderful human being at Lionsgate. Her name's Hillary Holmes. And she's the one who answers to the studio and it basically says, Hey, here's what Brent's trying to do. Uh, it's $1.5 million right now, you know, or whatever. Um, and we didn't have anywhere near that. We didn't have anywhere close to that. And then I had my music supervisor that was working on the production side. His name is Kevin Edelman. And he's like a very, very famous uh, music supervisor in, in Hollywood. So I had those two guys. But one something really cool happened um, when we got it all laid out and people started watching cuts. They're like, wow, this is cool. This works. How can we fight for this? Because we we get your vision. And it's, it was the coolest thing that's ever happened to me as a director. But people started rallying around me like Kevin was going out. He's like, hey, man, I want all this music in here. And he he went back out and started trying to see if people would give us discounts or give us a brother-in-law deal um Lionsgate ended up sending me more money uh we ended up short and then I think the producers even went out and like asked for a little bit more extra money at the very end just so we could do it so it was Lionsgate giving everything they had it was two music supervisors giving everything they had producers giving everything they had and then at the end too to be fair I had to capitulate on some stuff like I mean do I I had a George Harrison song in there that was half a million dollars you know and they're like they came wow. like, uh, yeah, uh, we're doing everything we can, but that's got to go. And I was like, I understand completely. So, uh, you know, but then, but what was really, what was really cool about that was we replaced it with this awesome Fleetwood Mac song. And, and, uh, so everything in the movie, we got at a discount. People found a little bit, people turned over rocks and found extra money for me. And, um, I really got to see most of what I had hoped to be in the movie actually make it in there which is usually that is not the case man you you throw all this real expensive music at it and then the studio comes back and says okay let's be real now uh you know 90 percent of this has to go you might get one or two songs but but it just came together for me and uh, i think for the entire movie and it was really cool because people saw how well the music was working and they really started fighting for it um because what happens, unfortunately, in the film world is people will start fighting the director um, because, you know, a director oftentimes wants something that's that's impossible, like financially. But in this particular case, they weren't fighting me. They were actually fighting for the movie and fighting to get all this music in the movie. So I felt like they were fighting with me, you know, like on my side. And it was a it was a really cool experience, man. I never really felt like people having my back that much. And, um, and I did have, I think it's, I think it's a director's job to kind of shoot for the stars always. And, you know, you're trying to take a really take high ground, right? Like that's what you should be doing. But in this particular case to see everybody say, yeah, we're going to take that high ground. We're going to help you, you know, and that it was a very special part of the, 
the process for me. But it was def- it definitely took a a village and a tribe to make it happen because I was I was uh, getting made fun of a lot for my my expensive tastes <laughs> in music, you know. But uh, but yeah, I'd say eighty five percent of what we dreamed for, you know, we got, and uh, it was a very very special very special uh, process and experience in this in this title for sure. Well, it, it is a special, special movie. And, 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 you know, I guess the aesthetics of the movie with, with these songs, it really takes you back to that era with the, with the, with the, uh, with the clothing, with the way that it was shot, with the locations, uh, with the, the cars on the street. Um, but that music really takes it back to that era. I, mean, I was a toddler in that era, but it, 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 watching old TV shows, old movies, it takes me back. It's like it was shot in the early seventies that, you know, just just listening to the score of the movie as as you're watching it, that that was fantastic. To yeah, me. man, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, Anna Redman was the costume designer; she worked so hard. Amy Holmberg was the production designer. We had an amazing transportation department, and like, it was like a dream. It was like a kid in a candy store. But they would come in and tape uh, all these cars up, and it was a show and tell. And I could just walk through and go. Yeah, give me that one. Give me that one. Don't care for that one. Give me that one. Give me that one. Don't care for that one. Like, literally, the, cool. you know, we would just pick. And and so all the choices people take for granted, you know, like just the hundreds of choices every day that people are making for the movie. And, and uh, you know, John Irwin said it beautifully, the other director. He said, I want this movie to feel like we dropped a camera into 1969. And that was such an awesome directive. And it was, it was pretty frightening, right? Because, you know... Uh, pulling a pulling a period piece off is always daunting and and but everybody just rose to the challenge and the level of attention to detail in every department to get us back there was amazing to watch and uh man we just had the right people on the right seats uh on the pirate ship and uh everybody started rowing like crazy and you know we didn't we didn't hit the rocks but uh but man oh, i appreciate you i appreciate you saying that man that means a lot we um we all worked really hard to create a um, to create uh, a period movie that we felt like really reflected the time and and created a vibe and a feeling like you were there. Um, I remember, you know, going back to like the insecurity of of many artists. I remember we we did a huge road show for this and we started pre-screening it everywhere lots of churches lots of christian colleges and i remember the closer i was getting in the road show to southern california i was i was going okay this is about to get real because someone from southern california is getting ready to walk up to me and go i was there and this all happened around me and i was at calvary chapel and here's what i think of your movie so i was like bracing myself you know but even those even those comments were just so kind and generous and and most people really got hit by a wave of nostalgia and said wow, you know, you took me back there. Thank you. So that's just huge kudos to the team. And on top of that, man, I, I'd say like towards the end of, I know we're getting towards the end of this, but um, filmmakers can work as hard as they want and we can move our furniture around and set our dumb little cameras up and the actors can go out and do their thing. But at the end of the day, man, like you're really hoping something shows up in your movie that no human being can take credit for. And I really do feel like that happened in Jesus revolution. I, I still get hit by it and will cry uh, even in the theater watching it with people, but there's just, a, there's a love that comes off the screen that is it's, it transcends a, a filmmaking process. And I love what I do. It's fun. I enjoy it. But, um, but something happened on that movie in particular where there's just, uh, there's a really strong spirit of love that, actually comes off the screen and hits you when you watch it. And, um, and man, that's, uh, that's something that none of the filmmakers will take credit for. I can assure you. And so it's just neat when you feel, um, when you feel like something is, is there in the work that's transcendent and it's not from human work or just human verve or grind or whatever you want to call it. There's something more there that's, uh, that's very special to me. So I have a lot of gratitude for that, for sure. Well, it, it's it, the def, the, again, the, the, I, I got realness from this movie and there was nothing that was seemingly sugar coated. It was, it was real life. And, 
I, I appreciate that because real life is blood and gut sometimes. But through, it's, uh, at one point in this movie, the gospel was presented for folks like me who are failures and, and, and blow it. And, and, and there's redemption in this movie. So I, I, I certainly appreciate that, that you guys, you weren't sugarcoating anything. You, you, you put real life out there, real experiences. And um, so I, I certainly appreciate uh, that from this movie, uh, Brent. Uh, but, but speak to me, just, to, just encourage those folks out there, maybe younger folks that have faith and they want to be a, they want to be a filmmaker or they want to go into the arts and I, I can tell you, we don't have enough of those in, 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 in our society. How would you encourage someone who is, who is maybe younger, they want to go into the art field or, or the arts or movie making, filmmaking, what have you, uh, and they have faith? What, what would you say to yeah, them? First of all, I want to commend you um, just for some of your choice of words. I feel like a failure, too. Um, failure is interesting, right? Because I guess if you fail one time in your life, you, could te- you are technically a failure. Um, but um, I don't know, man. Failure is pretty amazing because you really get to see what somebody's made of when they get up off the ground and they try again. So in that sense, I I kind of like the failure because I want to see what happens when I get up and dust off and learn to forgive maybe myself for whatever happened, but forgive whoever else causing whatever whatever the trip up where I you know face planted. You know, maybe probably I needed to own some of it, and other people, you know. But, um, but yeah, man, I think failure is a part of life. And I think, uh, we need to normalize that more and say, okay, yeah, we're going to fail. We're probably going to fail on a daily basis, but how can I show up tomorrow as a better dad, um, as a better husband, as a better friend, as a better filmmaker, as a better coworker, as a better leader, you know? And so I think failure is a part of when you get back up, you're asking those questions of how can I do better? And, um, and that's what I love actually about the gospel because Jesus never condemned. He would just always say, Hey, go, go and don't do it again. Go and do better. You know? And, um, (laughs) I don't know, man, pretty rad. Okay. So the filmmaking stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, believe it or not, man, there's, there's a lot of young people that really want to, um, use art as a, and incorporate expressions of their faith in their art and maybe not heavy handed to the degree of, um, you know, being a preachy film or, or whatever, but, you know, they definitely want to um, put some of their faith in their, in their art. And uh, I think that's natural and normal and cool, you know, and um, I would say um, you definitely, you know, go back to the failure thing. You definitely have to be willing to make bad stuff at the beginning and have a really high level of where you're going. So imagine you're going to start climbing Everest. You know, you got to get on the mountain and start climbing. Um, And uh, you may slip and fall and slide down to the bottom and have to start over. But, you know, if you have your sights on the summit, you're going to keep climbing. Um, I would say you've got to make stuff uh, and again, be willing for it to be bad at the beginning. Um, my, my first short films were pretty terrible, but every time I went out, I got a little bit better. And so again, I'm, I'm failing forward. You know, uh, I, uh, I remember submitting to Sundance and getting a rejection letter. And at the time you had to pay $75 even to submit to Sundance. And so I was broke and, uh, had a bunch of little kids and a mortgage and, <laughs> And um, that was a very hard, very expensive rejection letter to get. But, you know, uh, the next the next short film competition that I entered in, I made it all the way through to semifinals, then finals. I won third place, huge cash money on that one. And uh, and so it's just a it's a series of failures and successes, triumphs and tragedies. And as you keep going and stay in it just by sheer uh, like act of showing up every day magical things will happen but you have to you have to get on the mountain start climbing know that you're going to slip and uh slip down but it's amazing man like even with your slips you know 10 years later you look down and realize you gained some altitude you know so don't quit don't give up stay in it make stuff every day show up you know do the hard work put in the time um don't 
uh, don't neglect the amazing amount of trade craft that you'll have to learn if you want to be a good filmmaker. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to master. And there's a really, you know, to be at the Hollywood level, which I just feel like I'm starting to get into um, on a very low, you know, at the lower scale of that, you know, <clears throat> to get even to this level, man, it's taken me <laughs> like 20 years of hard work, you know? And so, so yeah, just you get in it for the long haul. And, uh, and if you keep showing up every day, like I think really magical things can happen, but it won't happen overnight. So, you know, I, I won't bore you, but John and Andy slung cameras for ESPN and, you know, they were on, camera crews like shooting football games and basketball games i was a production assistant on hasbro tv like hasbro toy commercials you know i first started so you got to start somewhere and starting small is is good and um and if you stay diligent you know in small things we know that is a principle right like you'll continue to move into larger and larger spheres and i i hope i'm not done i, I hope i'm still going you know hope even, you know, for even larger spheres than I am now, but, but yeah, it, but irrespective of where I land, I'm going to keep showing up, you know, and, and, uh, doing the work. And so, so yeah, that's probably, that's probably what I would say to aspiring kids. And obviously if you're watching this and want to talk to somebody, I, I love to talk to people. I'll, I'll take 20 minute zoom calls or phone calls with kids and talk to them about their career and uh, so find a mentor too. find someone that'll listen to you, talk to every filmmaker, every filmmaking uh, professional that, you know, uh, that you can um, get some information from or hear their stories. And, you know, yeah, just don't don't be isolated. Try to try to network and get out there and meet people. But, yeah, I I, I love talking to kids that are trying to do this and encourage them because you need encouragement, man. It's it's tough and it's hard to break in and. Uh, you definitely feel like quitting at times, which I have too. So, uh, so yeah, hopefully this is an encouragement to somebody. Well, I know it was and, and words of wisdom and, and thank you. I, I know that you're inspiring some folks out there that are either, either listening to the podcast or watching, but yeah, great words of wisdom, Brent. Uh, and as we bring the plane down for landing, uh, the Jesus revolution movie is, is, and you can view it out of your home now, correct? And I'll put the, the specific links of how to do that below the video, but can you speak briefly yeah, uh, about that? At the time of this recording, it's out on digital, so you could just uh, grab a digital copy off wherever you get your digital content. So if it's Apple or Amazon, uh, you know, Amazon Video, you can uh, buy a digital copy now. And then uh, April 25th, is the official street date for both DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, Pre-orders are out, but you know, at, if this if you're watching this after April 25th, then it's out on uh, Blu-ray and DVD. And then we've got some really interesting international uh, theatrical dates dropping throughout the rest of the year. So that will go into late summer. So uh, I know we've got dates for Singapore, Australia, Indonesia. I think they've just set a giant United Kingdom release date in June. Uh, and so, yeah, it's exciting to watch that. But that's all those release dates are on the Jesus Revolution movie website. Uh, so you can track if you've got friends that you're hoping will watch it internationally or whatever. Um, you could go to the Jesus Revolution international release date. Uh, we have a, a page on the website that gives you the, the international dates. Well, thank you for that. And I'll definitely put the links below. And, and lastly, uh, Brent, uh, can you speak about any any projects maybe that you're currently working I on? I really hope to do something else with Kingdom and Lionsgate. I really appreciated this opportunity. And, um, you know, if there's any other word of encouragement I can give, you know, for, for 20 years, my phone hasn't been ringing off the hook, <laughs> you know? So when you do get an opportunity, it, it means a lot to you. So this has been a really huge opportunity for me. I'm very grateful. And I, I'd like to go back out with these guys. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I have have a lot of things swirling. Um, I've told my wife and my kids, I'll probably have it sorted here in the next four to six months of, of you know, what I'm going to do. But I would say probably the, the, the strongest bet will be that I'm there's going to be another Kingdom Lionsgate title coming from from me uh, here in the next couple of years, and I'm 
really excited about it. Lionsgate has been an amazing partner. And, you know, you said something else I didn't speak to. This would be a great thing to close on. Um, look for look for better faith movies in Jesus Revolution in the future. Uh, I think it's just going up. I think more and more people are seeing that you can do this and have artistic quality, tell a good story, have great characters, have great actors, have a Hollywood vibe and a Hollywood level of technical tradecraft. And, uh, and also tell cool stories about faith that don't, you know, try to ramrod it down somebody's throat, but does it in a very beautiful way that, uh, maybe would challenge someone or get someone thinking about their faith, but not um, not try to trick someone or hijack them or, or you know or, or fill it fill them with fear or anything, but just um, uh, deliver uh, you know some faith content in a way that is artistic and beautiful and kind. You know, so I definitely think there's going to be a lot more movies like this coming. I think it's a wave right now, and I think um, I think. <laughs> I don't know if this is good for me or bad, but you know, I think even more talented people uh, from Hollywood are going to get involved, and I think it's going to just continue to get cooler and cooler and better and better. And uh, so, I think if you're a faith movie fan, I think it's a good time to be alive. I think uh, we're headed into a really cool era uh, with like faith genre films coming out of Hollywood. Good news. And uh, so Brett, BrettMcCorkle.com is the best way to yeah, keep and Instagram up with you. Too. I love Instagram. I'm on Facebook, um, but Instagram's great too. But yeah, you can reach me on the website too. Well, uh, Brent, I'm going to ask you to stay on just 30 seconds post-interview to make sure everything is uploaded. But man, thank you so much uh, for, for taking a lot of time today and, and being generous and talking about what you're working on and, and the Jesus Revolution man, thanks movie. For thank you so on much. It. Thank you for the questions. I really... I really appreciate it. Filmmaking is uh, is really tough. It's really rewarding. Um, but um, but yeah, man, it's uh, it's fun to go out and and make these stories and work really hard because you end up getting to have these beautiful conversations with people like all over the world about you know why you made made the story or wanted to tell the story. So, man, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. 